Cool. That was good. Interesting. <laughs> All right. So uh, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, Fifty Shades of AppSec. And this is a, a talk which is very kind of very broad reaching. We're going to look at a bunch of different security things. It uh, is meant to show you how wide this industry is, how many crazy stuff, uh, or how much crazy stuff actually goes on. And I thought where we might start with this is just talking a little bit about how accessible hacking is today. And I guess we've got a lot of devs out there, probably not a lot of people who, uh, who go home and put on their hoodies and, and hack stuff. So hopefully this will give you a bit of an idea of how easy it is to break into stuff. And I wanted to start with this kid. And this kid was in the news a couple of years ago. And he hacked the Xbox. And he did genuinely hack it as well, a five-year-old kid. Because what he's done is he's managed to circumvent the parental controls on the Xbox so he can play Call of Duty or whatever it is that five-year-olds want to play that they're not allowed to. He's on the Microsoft Security Researchers Hall of Fame. He did actually get a bug bounty for it as well. How proud would you be as a dad? You know, and look how excited he is. He's totally stoked. So he got paid money, he's found this risk, and he's five years old. And it was actually a vulnerability. So when I talk about democratizing hacking, it's making it so accessible to everyone. And what a lot of people don't realize is just how easy it is to hack into stuff and just how accessible tools are to help you do it. So tools like this, this is a Chrome extension. It's called Bishop. You install the extension and then you just browse around the web doing what you would normally do when you're browsing. And in the background, it goes around and it looks for things like exposed version control systems, misconfigured admin tools. So it's making these requests to things like uh, .git in the, so in the roots of the repository. So is there a .git repository in there somewhere? And it finds it and it collates it all and then you come back and you review it. And then once you find the source control repository, well, use your imagination. <laughs> it all sort of goes downhill from there. And the, the crazy thing about this is that this really is just something that runs in the background. So you need not know anything about security and you can run these tools. If you do actually want to learn how to break into websites, you can find a lot of tutorials. So things like this. This is a tutorial that shows how to find a URL that has an ID in it. You put a single quote in that ID so it's no longer an integer. You load the page and now you've got an exception that shows a SQL error. And what you do then is you go and you copy the URL and you go to this free software called Havage. You paste it in there and then you get all the data. And that is literally it. That is the entire thing end to end. I'm going to demo this uh, firsthand tomorrow morning and you'll see just how easy it is to actually get all of the data out of a system. It is literally copy and paste. So if you actually want to learn how to break into systems, you can find a lot of information like that. If you want to delegate the breaking in of systems to someone else, you go and hire a hacker. And there are websites like this, which are designed just purely to hire hackers. These are the hackers. You can see that they're, uh, they're a nice sort of gender, race, age diverse group, which I think is very important in hacking. <laughs> they all look very friendly. You can start a project for free as well. You know, this is how accessible it's becoming to actually get people to break into systems if you don't want to learn how to do it yourself. Now the problem we've got is that because it is so easy to break into these systems, we've got issues like this, hacktivists. Who actually knows what a hacktivist is? Because it's like we've, we've got a bit of an opinion, right? Like there's some kind of shady character, maybe it's anonymous, maybe something like that. Uh, I really like this definition of a hacktivist. Now firstly, if you're not already following Swift on security, go and follow her or him or whoever it is behind this persona because they're, they're hilarious and they're actually really insightful as well. And this is very true, right? What we see is them breaking into systems and making up reasons why they deserved it. Give you a good example. Uh, one from down here a couple of years ago. Anonymous, we know they're anonymous because they told us. Anonymous <laughs> broke into an Australian government website defaced it, and it was op Australia, op Trapwire, op, you know, whatever, like they'll make something up. And they were obviously very proud of themselves, breaking into this Australian government website, uh, except it wasn't. It was an NGO. 
So they broke into a non-government organisation, which was a website to help people with uh, disabilities uh, recover, rehabilitate. But they thought it was a gov website, so they're like, okay, we'll just break into this stuff. And the reason why is whatever the hell they said on the previous page, it doesn't really matter. We saw something very similar earlier this year, actually. Anyone see uh, anonymous DDoSed Nissan? Right, like the car maker. Why do you reckon you DDoSed Nissan? Is it, you know, like you don't like their cars or? Give you a hint. So Nissan is from Japan. Why would Anonymous not like a Japanese company? It's the whales, right? <laughs> so, so Anonymous has DDoSed Nissan because Japan is doing scientific research with the whales. And that's what happened. So this is the point, right? They make up a reason. And, and sort of the serious note here is for all of you responsible for websites, you don't need to have something that's of obvious value. The fact that you are on the internet is enough reason. There'll be some other reason why they break into it later on. They'll worry about it then. Now, what that means is we get guys like this. So Jake Davies and Ryan Cleary, they're both here turning up to court after being busted as members of LulzSec. LulzSec was very active a few years ago. Broke into a lot of stuff, actually very, very effective. And again, just teenagers, kids to most of us in the colloquial sense of the younger than us. Turning up to court here with their mums, Look at the expression on their mum's faces too. <laughs> like they, are, they are well and truly grounded after this. But kids, right? And uh, incidentally, kids like this are really, really good at things like social engineering. If any of you have kids, think about how effective your kids are at pushing your buttons <laughs> on various things. Malicious kids are very good at doing that to organisations and getting information from them that they then use to break into other systems. So they're, uh, they're quite adept at that. On a bit of a more serious note, the, the problem that this creates is that you end up with kids like this that are curious, that are not yet really aware of the consequences of their actions, and they end up becoming criminals. Because this is what happens, they've broken into systems, they've stolen data out of there, they're going to get their asses kicked one way or the other. And for many of us who may have been kids before we had internet or smartphones or things like that, like we could get away with this stuff, it was localised, it wasn't a major thing. But you play up now and you play up online, and the next thing you know is you're a criminal. Now, we see a lot of interesting criminal activity online when it comes to hacking. So we'll see things like this. This is from Pastebin, and this is when uh, Dropbox was hacked. Except they weren't really hacked, because people make this stuff up. They go, hey, Dropbox got hacked. Here's nearly 7 million accounts on Pastebin. If you give us some Bitcoin, we'll put more stuff up there. It's not real, but they're hoping people will give Bitcoin. And when you can anonymize your identity and then you can go onto an anonymous service like Pastebin, dump stuff up there and then ask for Bitcoin, pretty low overhead, isn't it? You know, the ROI on that's gonna be pretty good. They don't have to get much Bitcoin for that to have made a lot of sense. More seriously though, one of the things that we've seen particularly over the last few months is stuff like this. This is from yesterday. This is allegedly 200 million Yahoo accounts. 200 million. Now, only about six or eight weeks ago, we saw on this same dark market website, we saw LinkedIn, 180 million accounts. We saw MySpace, 360 million accounts. And they were legitimate. They were accounts that were hacked out of both those organizations. They both acknowledged it and said, yes, this was us. It happened several years ago, and it just resurfaced but it appears on these dark market websites. And what's kind of fascinating about this is, first of all, if you have never visited a dark market website and it sounds like this hard to obtain place and it sounds like the online equivalent of like going down to the docks at night and there's shady people and you know, it's dangerous, it's not. <laughs> you open up the Tor browser bundle, which you can download for free, or you get any Tor address and you put .to at the end of it to use the Tor to web service, and you're on the dark market. And when you're in there, it will look familiar. It will look like eBay. We've got this guy here. You can see under Yahoo 200 million, it says, buy peace of mind. Peace of mind is a good guy. He's got 100% positive feedback, right? He sold a bunch of different other data breaches. He sold LinkedIn and he sold MySpace and his product was good. Good in the sense that it was what was represented. 
Reputation is really, really important in these sites. So when you see this and you see Yahoo being sold by someone with 100% positive reputation and a track history of delivering, you go, this is probably going to be legit. So watch this. Over the next few days, we might actually see Yahoo acknowledge it. At the moment, they're like, we can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> they can't take that line for too long. Now, in case you're wondering, for dark market websites, like, is it, is it really dark or is it just a little bit shady? Whilst you're on this site buying Yahoo data, you can also buy cocaine. Because all this stuff is on the same site. Data breaches, cocaine, drugs, exploits. It's all on the same site. This guy's a good guy too. He's got 100% as well. Must be good. Five grams of cocaine. No worries. And it all sits there on this one site. And this is what's sort of happening now where we've got this class of, of commodity, if you like, which is the data breach, which is sitting alongside cocaine. So interesting times. All very, very accessible data. Other criminal activities we see often perpetuated online, sometimes perpetuated in real life, is stuff like this. This is a couple of years ago, and these guys were sending around these extortion notices. Now, this was actually in the mail. It gets folded up, put in an envelope, sent out. This went to a uh, pizza shop in New York and said, we haven't done anything to you yet, but unless we, you give us Bitcoin, and it's always about Bitcoin, right? Because it's much harder to trace. Unless you give us Bitcoin, we're going to say that you're growing marijuana, you know, or that you've got rats in your kitchen or something like that. And they're just threats, just extortion. It's like standover tactics, but it's all done remotely. And you pay your Bitcoin online via anonymization services. So the web actually makes it really easy to stand up these sorts of malicious kind of intent sites. In fact, this is one of the problems with Tor. Tor is very good if you're a political dissident and you're trying to talk to people, or if your freedom of speech is being suppressed because you live in Beijing or Turkey or somewhere like that. Tor's great for that, but it's also great for doing really, really nasty stuff. In fact, recently Cloudflare said that 94% of the traffic that they saw come from Tor was malicious. And then Tor said, nah, like that's not right. <laughs> you know, it's nearly not that bad, but there is a huge amount of traffic on Tor, which is bad news. Other criminal sorts of activities you see, stuff like this. Uh, because you might have been wondering, what do hackers do with the money once they get them? Well, you know, now we know where they spend it. <laughs> now, the, the reason why this works so well for hackers is that they're compromising routers. And what they're doing is they're using attacks such as cross-site request forgery, where you go to a page and your browser is tricked into making a request to somewhere else. They use CSRF risks in modems to update DNS settings. So you're just browsing around the web and you go to, it might just be a news site, and there's an infected ad there, because you can buy ad space, you can run your own script in ads, and it causes your browser to make a post to change your DNS to their malicious server, and then when you type in mybank.com, you actually go to their bank.com, because you can reroute the traffic with DNS. So we see that sort of criminal activity happening quite a bit. And on the one hand, you might look at this and go, well, this is really depressing, right? There's all these criminals breaking into all our things. The good news is, is that they also, they also kind of screw up <laughs> quite a lot. They do some really, really stupid things. And I, I thought it might make us all feel a little bit better if we looked at some of the stupid things that criminals do. I'll give you an example. Here's a good one. This is from Stack Overflow. Now, this looks like quite a reasonable question. All right? Someone wanting to connect to a Tor hidden service using curl. The person who posted this was a guy named Ross Ulbricht. Ross Ulbricht was also known as the Dread Pirate Roberts, also known as the mastermind behind the Silk Road dark market, which was notorious for selling drugs. He was also uh, trying to have about six people killed, which didn't work in his favor <laughs> once he did get picked up. But the amusing thing about it is one of the things that actually eventually led the authorities uh, to Ross was he posted this Stack Overflow comment with an account that had an email address that was traceable back to him. And later on, he tried to cover his tracks, but Stack Overflow had this history of which email addresses had been against the account. So just one of these simple little operational security, OPSEC errors, and eventually brings them undone. So that was Ross. Uh, he's now in jail for probably forever. <laughs> you don't sort of get out when you run like a $40 million underground drug market and try and execute people. So he's staying there. Uh, another guy, this one here, Jihadi John. 
So uh, Jihadi John was an interesting character. He was in Syria, uh, and he liked to chop people's heads off, which is apparently what some of these guys like to do. And the interesting thing was, they do these videos and, you know, rah, 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 chop head, etc. And he had this uh, thick British accent, which apparently is unusual for a Syrian jihadi. And, and they're trying to figure out who he is because he's got the mask on and everything and you can't really see. So the authorities are watching it. And they're obviously watching a lot of stuff that's coming in and out of Syria, connection-wise. And uh, they find that there's someone buying web development software in the UK from a Syrian IP address. And in order to get a bit of a discount, they use their student ID. And it was this guy, Mohammed Mwazi. So, so in order to save a few bucks from his Syrian lair, I assume it's a lair or something like that, he's bought this web design software. And how's that? Likes chopping off people's heads, CSS, HTML. Anyway, so... Um, they found him, identified him. I was reading the news just the other day. He uh, uh, apparently had a meeting with the drone recently. So uh, he won't be doing any more chopping of heads or web development either, as it may be. But he, uh, yeah, it's just such a stupid little thing, isn't it? Anyway, so we're happy with that. It's good that he got caught. Uh, another really interesting case of uh, criminals getting caught is this one. Now, this is curious for several reasons. Uh, number one, this is uh, the girlfriend of someone who was known as Wormer. You can see the second line there, Wormer and cabin crew. And Wormer liked hacking Texas law enforcement. Now, I've not been to Texas before, but I always have the impression as an Aussie, you know how we get these impressions of the US? I don't reckon they have a lot of sense of humor over there about people hacking them, not in Texas. So anyway, he's gone around hacking the cops in Texas. And at some point in time, he said to his girlfriend, and his girlfriend was in Melbourne too, he said, hey, I've got this really good idea, right? What you do is you print out this sign, you lean over like this, and then with your iPhone, you take a photo, and then we'll dump it on the websites after we own them. Now, what does your iPhone capture when you take photos? XF data, geolocation, down to like nine decimal points or something like that. So inevitably, what's then happened is the cops have pulled the data. They've gone, oh, look at this. She's down in Melbourne. It's down in one Turner in Melbourne. And then I can only assume that they've got like a general location, might be an apartment building, and they've had to take the photo <laughs> and somehow match it and figure out who the individual is. But here's what I found especially curious about this. This is who it was. All right, this is the girl. This is Wormer next to her. And they look normal, right? Like they look like perfectly normal people. They don't even have hoodies, right? <laughs> and they're going around hacking Texas law enforcement. And to me, this speaks volumes to that earlier point about democratization of hacking. There are so many people that get involved in breaking into things that are otherwise very normal, respectable people. And they just turn out to be like this. Now this also got me thinking because we've got this case here where there are these normal everyday people breaking into our things. Are we making it too easy? Is there something we are doing, and I say we as in us as developers, are we building software which is too vulnerable? So I went looking and I found some stuff. And this is one of the first things I found. Just tell me when you have a sense of what might be wrong here. It's good, isn't it? You never forget your password. If you have to reset your password, you have a problem. <laughs> you can't share it with anyone, which means you also can't get any phone calls. You can Google this text and you will find this site. It does exist, it's real, it's out there, which is kind of curious. So sometimes we are making it too easy. I'll give you another good case. This is Betfair. Betfair is an online betting site based in the UK. And I was watching a discussion, this was just last year, a discussion between a journalist and Betfair support. And the journalist is saying to Betfair support, he says, I've just gone on to do a password reset on my Betfair account, which is what you see here. I entered my username, which is my email address, and my date of birth, and then I set a new password. You didn't have to get an email. All you had to do was have the email address and date of birth. And the Betfair person is arguing with them. He's going, no, 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 like this isn't right. You know, it doesn't work that way. 
And first of all, if every, any of you have anything to do with social media accounts representing companies, don't argue with your customers on Twitter. It's a public timeline. And someone like me will see it and then go and test it for myself. Because he was right. And this argument kept going. And I eventually recorded a video of the whole thing just because it was so ridiculous. But what, what ended up happening is that like, it's like the penny dropped and the Betfair guy's gone, OK, right. Uh, yes, that does work that way, but you shouldn't share your username with anyone. And the journalist was going, but it's my email address. That's how I get email. I give it to people and they send the email to me. And then, then Betfair's going, well, you shouldn't be sharing your birth date with people. And the journalist's like, but I like presents and cake and stuff like that. <laughs> And, uh, and he was right. The journalist was right. And Betfair had this really screwy implementation. Now, the funny thing is, I did this talk in Amsterdam last year in a, a keynote for, uh, for an OWASP conference, a security conference. And after I did exactly what I did just there, this guy came up to me after the talk and he handed me a card. It was Betfair security. So, oh, shit, I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> But the guy was really cool. And what was really interesting, he said, look, we knew this was bad. Like, we knew this was ridiculous. But a marketing manager somewhere said that we should do this. And it was only after we got bad press that their hand was forced and they actually fixed the thing. And that has happened to me more than once, that exact same scenario. Someone's come up after I've used someone as an example and said, look, we knew this was bad, but it required a little bit of leverage publicly in order to fix it. So uh, I feel a little bit too sorry sometimes for the people behind these accounts. All right, so that was Betfair. Uh, now here's another one I found. This is JavaScript on a web form for the login page. Just see if you can see the problem. I'll give you a moment. <laughs> now a lot of you are laughing, but I think you're judging it too harshly. Think about the upsides, right? Scalability. <laughs> Doesn't matter how many people are trying to log in at the same time. Responsiveness, no postbacks, right? It's just you enter it in, bang, look, I'm logged on. Wasn't that fast? Marketing manager is very happy when he sees that because it's immediate. And people do these things. But think about it also like, okay, the developer has to do something stupid, granted. When testers come along, if they're not technical and they test it, it's like behaves as required. You know, they don't actually see the mechanics that are just behind this very high tech control called view source. <laughs> So, uh, so sometimes we see things like that, which is a little bit scary. Here's another one just recently. This is a sitemap. This is the email address and password of every single person on the site in the sitemap. This is a major US ISP. I've obfuscated their name, but <laughs> it was legit. That's what it was. I checked it the other day. Fortunately, they've fixed it. But you can almost kind of imagine at some point someone has gone, well, like users are sort of uh, entities in the system and a sitemap is kind of meant to model entities and then their passwords are like attributes of the entities. So maybe I'm giving them too much benefit of the doubt. <laughs> but uh, this is what they did. This happens. So we see some really screwy stuff. This is obviously, I, like I want to say misconfiguration, but it's not even misconfiguration because someone at some point had to code this and say, let's put all the stuff in the sitemap. Other times we just see outright bad code. So this was one that popped up last year as well. And this is a bad case of SQL injection. And in case you haven't seen SQL injection happen before, my talk first thing tomorrow, we're going to do this. We're going to break some stuff firsthand. But this one line of code here, where we're concatenating this SQL statement with some data in a text field, is vulnerable to SQL injection. This was from last year, a blog post from last year, teaching other people how to write a password reset feature. Other people are going to this blog post and copying the code and building their own applications. This is why SQL injection is still such a big problem. A little bit further up from here, they needed to define the connection string. I want to show you how they did the connection string and just see if you can spot any problems with it. So other than the fact that this is really not how you want to define a connection string in ASP.NET, uh, that ID kind of lets you do anything. SA, SA account, you can do anything to the database. That password, <laughs> I hope everyone knows what is wrong with that password. 
And the thing is, some people would say, well, look, it's just a demo. It's just an example. You know, like this is not the thing that you're meant to be paying attention to. But any piece of code that you put on the web will get copied and pasted and people will build other things from there. So that's, that's a bit of a problem. We're obviously making things really easy on hackers when they break into our systems. But I think that we're also making it too easy on the users using our systems to do stupid things. In fact, sometimes we're encouraging it. I'll give you an example. This is Lego. And on the Lego website, you need to create a password, right, if you want to create an account. And they give you a bit of advice. This is really, really bad advice. <laughs> now, it's, it's not just the short, but the, like, look at the language of it. Big and small letters. And I suspect that they're trying to appeal more to kids. I mean, it's, it's Lego. You can imagine a lot of kids using it. But this is also not really the advice we want to be giving our kids. It's not the precedent we want to set, right? Like, we don't want to be saying, hey, mate, like, go and create an account and look at what Lego says. Don't take security advice from Lego. It's the lesson here. So that one is, that one's quite unusual and it sets consumers, end users, up for failure. This one is also problematic. And this is problematic for multiple reasons. Now, first of all, if you've got a system which is banning certain words, like wankers, and another a whole lot of other naughty words, they're naughty word listers in JavaScript, and it makes a very entertaining reading. <laughs> Why are they blocking that? And I'll give you a hint, they're not blocking password, ABC123. They're only blocking naughty words. Put another way, uh, do you think when you create an account and you use a naughty word in your password, the hashing algorithm gets a little bit offended, a little bit upset? <laughs> hashing algorithm doesn't care. However, the operator at the other end who can see your password because it's not being stored properly or they're requesting it over the phone, which is a very insecure transport mechanism, the operator does get offended. So when we see naughty words like this, it's because a human is going to see it somewhere. And that tells you something about the way they're storing passwords. Kind of ironic too, Branson of all people, <laughs> to, to be sort of a little bit politically correct, you know, let's not use words that might offend anyone. This is a guy who every time he launches something is just there with like a bevy of bikini babes in a tank. So here's an interesting character. Now, one of the other things we, we see when it comes to security on the web, obviously we have a lot of, uh, a lot of rules around things like passwords. Uh, we also often require things like uh, security questions. You know, they're going to ask you a question and only you should know the answer to the question. And that's like another layer of verification. They can ask you something else. This is not how you do security questions. This is problematic. And it's problematic because it's not a security question. It's a pub trivia question. Right? It's, it's like, what is the capital? Which is ridiculous. And this is something which has such a, a, a well-known answer that is ubiquitously known. And if you don't know it, you've got Google, that it's crazy. And then you go to the other extreme and you get security questions like this. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Can you imagine the grandmother calling the dog? <laughs> and it's, it's just, yeah, security questions full stop are really problematic for so many reasons. Uh, and part of the reason is we're so bad at creating them. You know, and when I say we, as an industry, when we create questions, if you're asking what people's favorite color is, that's not too good because you can enumerate that. It's going to be either red, green, blue, or a small percentage of answers that are something else. So when I see stuff like this, and we see this over and over again, where you look at a website and you go, why did they do that? This is such a bad security anti-pattern. You start to wonder if maybe the problem is us. So maybe we are being taught the wrong thing. Because there's a lot of education out there online targeted at developers. That example before with all the SQL injection in it, targeted at developers. Here's how to build a password reset feature. So I went looking and I thought I'll find some more stuff online to do with how we are teaching people about online security. And I found this little video. Hey, what's up YouTube? This is Next Gen Hacker 101 and today I'll be teaching you guys how to view other computers' IP addresses. Alright, what you do is you type in tracer T and space. Alright, this is a cool thing. Tracer T and then space. 
Now we just want to do is you want to type the site uh, you want to view. So you want to go HTTP semicolon slash slash and then uh, well not semicolon the little dot dot and then the website. So I'm going to say Google. Oops. So like, let's just say we want to see how many IPs are looking at Google right now. And like at this exact moment, we're going to find how many people are looking at Google, what their IPs are, and what their connection speed is. Here we go. Once you're done, trace your key, space, and then the website, http dot dot slash slash. And the website, I'm doing Google. You want to go ahead and do that as an example. And then you enter it. And here we go. Here they come. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> Seven, eight, nine, ten, and hold it, hold it. All right, ten people are currently using uh, Google and looking at it. <laughs> it's a slow day on the Googles, isn't it? Uh, but like, like the video at the start, right? It's a kid; they're having a go. You know, give them credit. I can understand why they're going to make some mistakes, and uh, you know, that's that's fine. He's a kid; we can tell. There's a lot of other material online, though, teaching developers about security that's not made by kids. A lot of it's made by professional organizations, professional training organizations. And some of them produce training like this. Now, have a look at this and just tell me when you spot the problem here. I'll know, because everyone will start laughing. What's the problem with um, base64 encryption? <laughs> base64 decryption. Base64 is encoding, and encoding has decoding. It is not encryption. Yet this online training resource is saying to people, just base64 encrypt your credit card. You're really going to upset PCI if you do that. You're probably not going to be able to take payments anymore if they figure out you're doing that. Professional online training. Now, it's really interesting as well to have a look at the sorts of questions people ask online about security, and particularly some of the answers you get. And I was browsing around Stack Overflow a little while ago, and someone asked the question, they said, uh, I would like to build a system and store passwords securely. It's a good question. But there are some really interesting answers, and this was one of them. Now, let's have a look at this and see what this is like in terms of password storage. Now, who knows what's wrong with this one? Let me walk you through it. You take your password, such as HAI, not a good password either, <laughs> HAI, and then for each character in the string, you get the ASCII value and you add five. And then you store that, and as per the description at the bottom, your output now contains the encrypted string. Guess how you decrypt it? <laughs> right? But here's the really hilarious thing, and I've got this screen capped on one of my blog posts. There was this, there was another answer, which also used base64 encryption, and then there was a third answer, and it referenced this one. I said, no, 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 this is not the best way to do it. What you do is you get the string, you get every character, you get the ASCII value of it, and you add 13, because it's stronger. <laughs> I kid you not, it's on my blog post. Uh, I, I took some backups of them just in case they were deleted from Stack Overflow, which they were shortly afterwards. And at least Stack Overflow is a curated sort of Q&A site. So this sort of stuff drops to the bottom. But one of the things that struck me is that this answer came very, very quickly after the question. And I don't think that someone just sat there and typed it out. Where do you reckon they got it from? It's like, oh, I know, I did that last year. You know, they've gone to their system, they've taken the code, and they've whacked it in the answer. And the scary thing for all of us to think about is that we all have passwords in other systems that are stored this way. I guarantee it. And frankly, they're stored worse than this, because we've all got passwords in a lot of systems that are just plain text. As bad as it sounds, this is better than plain text. If only to confuse people, <laughs> but it is better than plain text. So. Sites like Stack Overflow are really interesting. You know, looking at the things people ask and the answers you get. Uh, here's another really interesting question that tells you something about the way some banks are built.
I can see CBA people here, and I'm just really hoping <laughs> it wasn't you guys. Oh, man, imagine using that. It's like every other day, something in WordPress is broken. And you can sort of only hope that maybe this was just a bit of a troll and it wasn't anything serious. But this is the thing, right? Security is a confusing concept for many people. You know, there's all this stuff about hashing, encryption. And I can understand why sometimes it's difficult to even know the difference between PGP and Wingdings. <laughs> it's like, look at the Wingdings. They're all little buildings and airplanes. Like, it looks like encryption, right? <laughs> And the only way you can decrypt it is you've got to select it all and change the font to like Arial or something like that. And then you can figure out what it actually is. So it, it is kind of scary seeing that stuff. And in fairness, like, okay, we do build a lot of bad stuff as developers. And I mean, collectively as an industry. But I think we also see a lot of bad stuff from our users as well. And let's face it, there are some stupid users out there. We've all had to deal with them, right? This is the nature of the industry. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, a little while ago, Twitter was hacked. Twitter, this is the headlines. Every day, Twitter gets hacked. What do you reckon actually happened here? Whose account is this? It's Burger King's. It's Burger King's account, but they've been hacked. So this was a few years ago. This was not Twitter being hacked. This was Burger King doing something stupid and now they're promoting McDonald's. But it's verified, so it must be legit, right? <laughs> That's not what verified means. Tesla got done last year. Same thing happened with Tesla. Verified account, but bad password practices. It sort of makes you wonder, though. Like, OK, clearly what's happened here is someone has been able to log into Burger King's account and change attributes. How does this happen? Like, how did Burger King disclose their passwords? And we can look to precedents. Good precedent is last year, TV5 Monde in France got hacked. Their Twitter got hacked. And this bloke from the, uh, from the TV company, he's come online and he's doing an interview explaining, yeah, yeah we got hacked. Look, we have no idea how we got hacked, um, you know, as he sits in front of all the passwords pinned up on the wall behind him, which wasn't a real good look. And obviously, the penny dropped. And they went, OK, all right, this is probably how it happened. Uh, so they came on TV the next day to explain how this thing happened. and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's this guy sitting there, post-it note. That's all good. This is why we have password managers, folks, <laughs> not post-it notes. So this is a bit of a problem where obviously users do stupid things. And pretty much every single time we see Twitter hacked, it is someone has done something stupid with their password. They've reused it. It's weak. They've disclosed it some way, maybe fallen for a phishing attack. But they have made a mistake somewhere. I think, though, that very frequently, we, as an industry, make it really easy for users to do stupid things. In fact, we condition them to doing stupid things. And I'll give you a really good example of that. It's a QR barcode scanner that needs a lot of access to a lot of things. If you want to scan a QR code with this app, you need to let them see your calendar. Maybe they're scheduling it. All right. <laughs> Got to give them your contacts, your location. The problem I have with this, though, is what do you reckon the one thing is most users see on this screen? Except, all right, like it's the big button that is getting between them and performing the activity that they downloaded the thing for in the first place. So the user's just going to go, great, except we'll jump into it. Most people probably don't know what these security controls actually mean. And of course, Google will say, well, you know, you've got to actually grant permission. Yeah, but you're not really thinking about it, you know? So this is more an issue with the manufacturers of this app, obviously. So this is a problem. And we are conditioning users to stupid security things by doing this. We're even conditioning them to stupid security things when they go to buy an HDMI cable. Did you ever know that you need an HDMI cable with antivirus protection? Because there's not enough crap out there already about HDMI, right? And not enough FUD. But imagine, right, your average consumer walks into the store, and they've got to buy an HDMI cable, and they've got two, and they're comparing them. <laughs> this one's got antivirus. This one doesn't. What are they going to do? And this is the problem, because we condition people to do these ridiculous security things. And I don't think it's 
necessarily the individuals themselves we have to blame because we've got to look at a bit of the way our messaging works as well. So the way that we're communicating to individuals, and particularly when you look at the way social media accounts of big companies online communicate, you see some really crazy stuff. So I saw this one a little while ago. And uh, what's happening here is the guy has said, hang on a second, the girl has said, I'm entering my credit card onto the page, it's HTTP. How can I trust the page if it's HTTP, which is a perfectly reasonable position to take. And Twoo has said, well, don't worry, you may have missed the bitmap we have on the page. That explains it's secure. Now, there's an interesting thing as well with these, uh, these logos, right? You ever see these verified by uh, VeriSign logos? There's the, uh, obviously, the Norton ones. There's a whole bunch of different logos. I saw a talk last year, and I learned something really, really interesting. Those logos are not the developer just putting a bitmap on the page. They get a service, say in this case, from, uh, from Norton, where they will scan the site on a regular basis for vulnerabilities. And that logo is loaded dynamically from the service doing the scanning. And whilst you're passing everything, you keep getting the logo. And this talk had the best name of any talk I've ever seen before. It was called Clubbing Seals, the Ecosystem of Security Logos. And what they wanted to do was prove how stupid these seals were. So what they said is, here's the trick. You monitor a site with one of these logos, OK? Day by day by day. Logo's still there, logo's still there, logo. Oh, logo's gone. What does it mean? Right, logo's gone, it means now they have a security vulnerability because it's removed dynamically. But it gets better. Because then they go, okay, well now we've got to figure out why the logo was removed. We've got to know what the vulnerability was. So what you do is you go and set up your own site that's a reverse proxy to their site. And then you go to VeriSign and you say, I would like to sign up for your service. And they scan your site, which actually scans their site and they tell you exactly what the vulnerability is. Clever, clever. You probably knew security seals were useless anyway, but this just uh, goes to show it. So that's, uh, that's one example. Here's another one. This is British gas. What? <laughs> so, it's, there is this thing that seems to be happening lately where various websites block you from pasting a password. And it's not just that they've got like an on-paste event and they stop you, but they might look at key presses and they might look at other heuristics about how the password was entered. And the problem is, is that if you're really concerned about your security and you use a password manager, which you all should be using, and it automatically inserts the password into the field, you have a problem. It gets blocked. And as ridiculous as this may seem, it's not a one-off because just two days ago I found this one. How does a brute force attack against the ability to paste a password work? Because the only way I can figure it out is you've got to have like an army of hackers all pasting at the same time. Because how else do you brute force a paste feature? <laughs> so, uh, so that's a couple of good examples. Another really interesting thing that you often see happen on social media is conditioning people to send sensitive information over Twitter. This is EE. Uh, EE, UK company, and what EE was doing is saying, hey, just DM us all your details. Now, if I was to create a Twitter account and call it EE support, and then when someone like Jay Shepard complained about a problem, I replied to them and said, just DM me your details, how many people would I get? Twitter would shut me down sooner or later, but I'd get a bunch of accounts, I bet you. Absolutely. Doesn't matter that they're verified and my account wouldn't be, because I'd just put their logo on and call it something that sounds like it's legitimate EE support. My favorite, however, this one was from a few years ago, but my favorite, and one that I still can't quite figure out, was from Tesco in the UK. They're like a big Woolies over there. And here's what Tesco had to say when I pointed out that they might have a few problems. I, I can't even begin to fathom <laughs> like, how that actually works. So they had dramas absolutely everywhere, and I, I wrote up a few pieces, and, and they, did, they didn't like some of it. <laughs> and they, but I mostly did it because of answers like this. Like Often I'll see something, and I'll tweet them and go, hey, you might want to do this or that or whatever. And it's usually only after they say something fundamentally stupid. And again, I do appreciate that it's like a social media person who knows nothing about security. But for God's sake, if someone engages with you like that, a really simple answer is, 
sure, why don't you DM me the details? Why don't we take it offline? Why don't we not have this debate in the public sphere where it may not end well? So that was, uh, that was sort of the advice that we're giving people via social media. And look, I mean, a lot of that was kind of funny, granted. There are other aspects of security that we're seeing that, that can be really, really serious. And this is sort of like the, the serious part of the, the talk, but it's, I find it fascinating. And uh, it's Ashley Madison. Was anyone in the Ashley Madison data breach? <laughs> Good answer. Correct answer, best answer is Ashley who? I don't know, never heard of him before. So Ashley Madison was hacked in July last year. Uh, their, their modus operandi was pretty explicit. You know, this is not like an adult website. It's not a normal relationship website. This is, let's have an affair. Their whole promotional campaigns, everything was around, life is short, have an affair. So in July last year, someone broke in, stole all their data, and said, if you don't shut down, we're going to dump it all publicly. And they gave a sample of just two records. And the two records were legit. The people in those records said, yeah, this is my data. I was on there. So we got through to August, just a little bit later than this time of the month last year, and everything got dumped publicly. And it was over 30 million unique accounts. And these are individuals who signed up to the website with the express intent of having an affair, because that is what the website says. And everyone went nuts, which, which is understandable, because this is like a massive breach of privacy. And regardless of where you stand ethically on the position of having an affair, to spread all of that all around the web and make it so easily accessible was just a really, really negative thing you know, for everyone involved. Now, when something like this happens, you get a lot of people who want to capitalize on the misfortune of other people. So you get things like this. This is a site which allowed you to search for people in Ashley Madison. Now, for context, some of you may know I run a site called Have I Been Pwned, where there are 1.3 billion accounts from data breaches. And you can search and find whether you've been impacted in Ashley Madison, in some cases, Adobe, 100 plus other data breaches. But when this happened, it was really clear that it's going to do damage to people if others can find that you have an account. So I made sure that the only way anyone could find out if you had an account is if you can get an email sent to the address you're searching for. So there is no disclosure risk. Incidentally, many sites of this ilk, there was another one called Adult Friend Finder, only a few months before that, that got hacked. You can still go to their password reset page and it will tell you if someone has an account or not. So they disclose it anyway. But anyway, I didn't want my site doing that. Sites like this did want to do that. And because everyone was going nuts, suddenly realizing that, first of all, there was this thing called Ashley Madison, because for most people, it's something they didn't know about. But secondly, going, I wonder if Bob next door was in there. You know, I wonder if my local MP was in there. I wonder if my boss was in there. People wanted to find out because they're nosy bastards. They just wanted to go and see who they could find in this data. So sites like this popped up. But why, right? So what is the value proposition? Why stand up a site like this? It makes more sense when you see it in context. Right? Ads. Ads everywhere. Divorce lawyer ads. Ads for spying software, because they know that if you're here, you are a nosy bastard, and you want to spy on other people. Some of the ads were from a company called mSpy, who was hacked several months earlier and had all their data exposed. So, so now you've got mSpy who was hacked being promoted on the Ashton Madison search page who was hacked, and the whole thing just goes a bit inception. It's like everyone's hacking everyone. It was worse than this. There were other sites that stood up which then tried to exacerbate the spread of these searches. So there's one called Trustify, PI group in, uh, in LA, and they decided that not only should you be able to search for people, but after you search for people, you should be able to tweet about it. So they had social integration, which is like just click the button and then click the Twitter button in the window that pops up, and you do this. And they thought it was such a good idea that they even favorited it as well. That's the Trustify logo, little blue one. Now, I can understand Jackie in this case going, you know, look, we've had a nasty breakup or something. I wonder if he was on there. You know, maybe I'd feel a bit better if I could find him. So I can get her curiosity. I struggle more with this one. Friends like those, wow. You know, they were encouraging you to go and search for your friends and then share the fact that you had found your friend in order to get more people to do the same thing. 
And then what they did is they said, if you want to contact us and give us 500 bucks, we'll tell you what data has been leaked about you in Ashley Madison. So that's how they monetized. When this broke, and I made the data searchable via people who could verify their identity, and I wrote a bit about it, I just got bombarded by emails. I got hundreds, if not thousands, of emails from people that were in the Ashley Madison data breach that were now petrified at, at being, uh, being outed, because many of them were having affairs. Many of them also weren't. There were women in there who said, I created an account there several years ago because I was worried my husband was cheating on me, found he was cheating on me, messy divorce, moved on with my life, I'm now happily married with someone else, except my email address shows up on there. And it looks like I was a member of Ashley Madison. So really important lesson there, sites like this, just because there's an email address on there, doesn't mean that they're out there having an affair. But some people were having an affair, and other people certainly had intents to have affairs. And as much as we may not like that idea, when you see some of the things they said, you realize how bad it was for these people. I read this before going to bed one night, which wasn't a real good idea. But, um, you know, like I can't be your guidance counselor. You can't sort of write to me and go, I'm committing suicide. And then there are multiple messages of this nature. So this had a really, really serious impact on people. And sort of the, the last part of the serious bit is it's just really interesting. Most of the time we build systems and they're users and they're sort of IP addresses and user agents and very anonymous people to us. But at the other end, we do have people that have real lives and in some cases lives that were destroyed. People killed themselves over the Ashley Madison data breach. People killed themselves because there are security flaws that ultimately disclose this info. And yes, they were having an affair and all that sort of stuff as well. But obviously the security of that site had a really major impact on a lot of people. Now, with that done, there's some really interesting stuff when we get to sort of the IoT bits of the world. And you, you've probably all seen some funky IoT stuff. And uh, we're going to talk specifically about IoT in a moment, but even just basic things where we take something that is digitized and we put it in the context of the physical world and we end up with unexpected security vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities like this. <laughs> you, you can imagine that like they've done their threat modeling and they're worried about evil cyber actors, nation states. They didn't have an envelope with a window <laughs> in the threat model. Simple things like this bring you undone. Another one that I think is hilarious, and I've seen multiple instances of this, is this. Now, in case you're not familiar with what's going on here, these are RSA tokens used for two-factor authentication. And what someone has done here, they've actually been very ingenious. They've said, the problem with two-factor is the second factor. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we will stick the tokens onto a box. We'll put the pins above them, because you need a pin as well. They've been obfuscated here. And then we'll point a webcam at it. And then you just load the webcam, probably publicly accessible, and you've got everything you need. I must find it and use it in a talk one day. But I saw a tutorial that teaches you how to do this with code samples and everything. And it's even OCRing the number on the 2FA token. The things that people will do. So that's, uh, that's a good sort of um, physical security problem. Another problem we had when it relates to security of physical devices, uh, and this was, this was just last year, was this one, VTEC. You know, see the VTEC hack last year? So VTEC was, uh, was really nasty because it involved kids. And what actually happened is uh, this journalist here, Lorenzo, uh, he writes for Motherboard, he emailed me one day and said, look, I've had a hacker give me a whole bunch of data that is allegedly from this Hong Kong toy maker, VTEC. And he asked if I could help him verify it. And I went through it and I found about 4 million adults, physical address, email, phone number, all the usual stuff that's in a data breach. And in total, about 6 million children. Name, gender, age, photos, foreign key to the parents, so now you know where they live. And this guy has pulled all the data out of the VTEC system. Now, the this good news story to the, that sort of came out in the wash with this is that he only gave it to the journalist, and the journalist only gave it to me, and I deleted everything uh, a little while back, so I don't have any of it. The guy got arrested in the UK, and I assume that Motherboard deleted their copy too. So it kind of it, it ended as well as something like that could. 
But one of the first things that I did when Lorenzo gave me the data is I went, okay, well, let's, we've got to figure out, is this legit? And sort of the first step for me when I get a data breach is I go to the website of the organization and I have a look around and I go, how likely is it these guys were hacked? So no penetration testing or probing or doing anything I shouldn't do, just use the website and have a look at how it works. And one of the things I noticed is they had a little Flash app where you could log on to this service. So Flash app, <laughs> there's your first warning sign. Log on to the service, and of course the Flash app is calling an API. And when I logged on, the API returned this result. Why are you returning internal SQL statements in your API? There are many other things which are actually far worse than this, but when you see stuff like that, if you see SQL statements anywhere on the public side of a web application, you know something's going to be bad. So that was VTech, and uh, it, look, this was a disaster. It was a real mess. It showed they've got absolutely no idea what they're doing with security. Uh, they have actually now moved into home security products. <laughs> this is not a joke. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not a joke. So they're selling home security products. <laughs> which, is, uh, which is kind of alarming. But while we're on the subject of home, the, the other thing, of course, we're getting in the home is a lot of IoT stuff. Uh, this is Lifex, Aussie invention, so we should be kind of proud that we've got something on the world stage doing well. They had a vulnerability, vulnerability in the light globes. And the interesting thing is a lot of people say when we have a vulnerability in something like light globes, they go, well, if a hacker manages to like, put the bedroom into disco mode, do we really care? their vulnerability disclosed the Wi-Fi password of the network. And what they said is, okay, now you've got to go and patch your light bulbs. How do you do that? It's one thing. Uh, uh, but we don't think anyone got owned by their light bulbs, which is kind of weird too, because if you did get owned by your light bulbs, it's because someone else is connected to your network and you're not going to think to blame the light bulbs. I pulled another example of this down just last night. These are vulnerabilities in Osram connected light bulbs. So lots of stuff like clear WPA PSKs, pre-shared keys, things like XSS. The light bulbs have an XSS vulnerability. <laughs> this is something that's really hard to grasp. But there's one more thing that's even harder to grasp when it comes to connected things. It's this. Anyone got one of these? They're from Japan, <laughs> as all funny toilet things are. <laughs> If you've ever been to Japan, you know what I mean. It's like you go in there and it's, I don't, like, is this the ejection button? What is it? Because there's just buttons and stuff everywhere. Anyway, so I found this stuff on the web. And there's these three screens. And I think the first one, the one on the top left, is some sort of a splash screen. <laughs> Jeez, is that bad? <laughs> the one in the middle, though, I'm particularly curious about. It's a calendar. Somehow generated by the toilet somehow containing some form of event-driven data, as best I can tell. <laughs> and then you've got the one on the front, and I kid you not, this is not something that I've fabricated, but it's obviously a music player, and the toilet is playing I Can't Get No Satisfaction. You can Google this and you will find it. So I showed this a couple of years ago in one of my talks, and I said the problem that we're going to have now is that we will have vulnerabilities in the toilet, and we will have all sorts of problems we never thought we would ever have. And then it happened. Trustwave had to put out an advisory. And this is terrifying. <laughs> and then I showed this at a recent talk, and someone said, yes, this is known as a backdoor attack. <laughs> All right, and on that note, that is the scary state of security. Thanks very much, everyone. If anyone does want to ask questions, we've only got lunch now, so I don't have to rush anywhere. So if you want to ask as a group or come up, then please do.